welcome again to DNAD Dinner with uh, a series of conversations with brilliant creative people who are here to inspire and equip the next generation of creative talent. And today we're having dinner with two terrific talents who um, both I and, well not both, me and the team, my team at Pentagram and Do The Green Thing are huge fans of uh, the two founders of the wonderful Adapt Climate Club, Josie Tucker and Rich Ashton. Hi, Josie and Rich. Hey. Hi. Thanks a lot for having us. You, uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on and having dinner with us. Uh, now, I'm pretty sure everyone who's um, tuning in today knows Josie and Rich, and that's why you're here. But just in case you don't, um, ADAPT are the force behind, a force of nature behind uh, things like sadness, uh, sadness is a no-go zone exhibition, uh, climate scars um, that they created a, a two, two, well, a series of 10, wasn't it? You, uh, you created and curated um, and really brilliant, sharply observed, as well as very funny guides to actually um, tackling um, people and their attitudes to climate change socially. Um, and given the accelerating climate crisis, uh, which is, as we know, the, bigger crisis, the biggest crisis there is, uh, their application and dedication and their creativity to the cause is a truly inspiring, inspiring example to us all. So it's great to have them here today. Um, so for those of you who don't know the format of the dinner with, it's a conversation with um, Josie and Rich, loosely structured around um, a starter where Josie and Rich share a project or two from the start of their career, um, a main course where Josie and Rich share a project or a couple of projects that have helped to define their career to date, and then a next meal where um, they, um, they point to something that's inspiring them about what creativity uh, can and should be going forward, something that they haven't created. Um, and as Josie and Rich share their work, um, you will have questions, I think. If you have questions, then please um, ask them in the chat window so I can put them to Josie and Rich between the courses. And don't forget, we're all having dinner, so let's all be in the conversation. So uh, Josie and Rich, um, Let's start at the beginning, if that's okay. So why why did you feel the want or need to start ADAPT? So talk us through the birth of ADAPT, if you don't mind. Yeah, so um, it was, I think about three and a half years ago now. Um, we were both studying on our master's degrees and Trump was being elected, Brexit had just been uh, voted for and the climate crisis was just, suddenly worsening well it wasn't worsening but the news was slowly becoming more apparent um that we really really were at the final sort of uh stage of being able to help ourselves and i was just really struck by the fact that um i didn't hear very many conversations in my social circles or academic um circles talking about climate change in the same way that we're talking about these other more immediate issues um well not even more immediate because climate change is but it I guess it felt like that um so I essentially made a mailing list um and emailed everyone saying hey I am in a hole of despair about this um if anyone's feeling the same way come over to our house, um, we've got some wine and we have some people that we found inspiring to do some talks. Um, and we just basically started a wine and climate despair discussion group, which sort of snowballed into a company. And after the first couple of meetings, Rich uh, got involved and we started making work together. Um. Yeah, because it was, it was almost like because Joe, so we because we were both studying on our MAs at the time, and Joe, you had finished, you had finished had your hadn't you, and I still had a few months left. Yeah, and so kind of like Joe's in this, I guess that happens after your MA, you kind of like wanting to do something. I was still like I'm deep in deadlines and struggling, um, and yeah, then we kind of just came together after that. I think. Yeah, and and how do you and did you? Um... So in a way, you made it a theme or something to um, uh, basically turn your uh, practice towards. But did you decide how early did you decide to actually make it your business effectively? You know, how you would actually how would you actually how would you generate income? What was the relationship between work to actually make a living and this this work? 
so it took us a little while it's actually um a bit of a complicated process because it the whole I'd say first year of us being active we were just testing things seeing what people were interested in and learning um we put ourselves on like a boot camp of just like learning as much as we could as fast as we could whilst trying to do as much as we could yeah um it was only after about a year that we finally decided we were getting a bit more traction and good feedback from people so we just thought if we don't try and actually make a living out of this it will take up about 90% of our time (laughs) no matter what jobs we're doing and it was all we could think about so we just thought we don't know if it's going to work but we'll give it a go Um, and then it's been a gradual uphill climb (laughs) since then but yeah we've managed to sort of shape a business in our own way which has been a really really nice experience. Yeah Um, a a great question from Jordan already Um, Jordan's asking is it a good idea to do things for free on your own first before you can get paid for it? So I guess that's um, them thinking about um, doing some work in the climate space, um, you know, you cutting your teeth with it, getting used to that process, or maybe making connections before money flows in. Is that what you did? Is that a good idea, do you think? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say definitely. I think that that is basically how we started Adapt, and that's how we've shaped it to kind of be our, our own thing. I think if we had kind of, we there wasn't money at the beginning and we just started doing and we found the best way to learn and test the way we use language, test the way we communicate was just by just doing. If we had waited for money to come through and then done a lot of planning, it would have been slow and I don't think we would have learned as much. Um, yeah. Compared to the beginning, yeah. like the way we, how much we've learned and how much we've improved as designers and communicators, I think, um, like really, we, we think it shows in our work quite a lot because we you just we just did gave a lot of time to it figured everything out with freelance work at the time and then and then yeah and then slowly eventually I guess like money's come in um and that's kind of tends to be more through client work but as a, it's as adapt so that's been quite nice yeah and and before that happened you were working both independently uh as as self-employed or freelancers were you um yeah so we had a bit of a I think we both went through a lot of different, um, testing out a lot of different things. Um, I worked freelance as a photography assistant slash project manager. Um, And then I worked as a graphic designer in the fashion industry for about a year and a half. Right. Um, In and out of like full-time positions and freelance. Uh, and just didn't really get on with any of it. <laughs> like I think because we were spending so much time thinking about the climate crisis, for us it was just really hard to like grapple with grapple with anything else. Like no matter how interesting or exciting it was, like it just didn't. Yeah. Really, yeah. Yeah. I think that's true because like even though like some of the freelance work we were doing, like we really enjoyed, and there was stuff we kind of really wanted to do and like for companies we really wanted to work with, but we'd get home often after work and be working on Adapt. Or we'd be there messaging each other all the time right through work. I remember working for one one client and then I was just quite, like, I remember there was a particular thing we were doing and I was just always on my phone messaging Joe's, going through ideas and stuff like that, kind of like not really doing any other work. So I think it, it was it basically had to eventually just start doing Adapt yeah. as, our, as our main main project yeah. that sounds more that sounds more than a side hustle or a side project that sounds like your main project doesn't it and <laughs> yeah yeah um I, I wonder whether we can um sort of have a look at your starter now or your starters so you, um it was um in a way the, the brief for a starter was uh, or the question is could you share um a project or two with the people tuning in um that uh, w- was was about how you got your first break or how you sort of set your direction for the work that was coming after the work that came afterwards yeah yeah definitely yeah you could go into it i think because i think where it starts was on our um we both picked our ma ma projects that we kind of were working on at the time partly because i think it kind of led to adapt also because they were very different but they were had ele- elements were just kind of really they were our own thing but then it's weird how they then came together to then i guess essentially form adapt in a way yeah 
but let's have a look at your starter projects. <laughs> so this is actually, uh, so at the end of M- MA, I self like published a book, only a small run just to sell at art fairs, but it was kind of, I was really interested in looking at the relationship between work and leisure and essentially what people do with their free time and how it seems quite, it seems quite dark, but it's just how experience is manufactured to kind of keep us distracted from uh, doing anything productive in our free time. All right. Human world, I guess, um, which kind of was speaking and my frustration of what to do with my time, which led to adapt. Right. Um, the way I worked was almost the opposite to adapt. There wasn't humor in it. It was quite, it wasn't the most accessible work, but obviously I really enjoyed it and like got, did a lot of type design and I was really interested in publications and publication design and book design at the time. But I think it was kind of almost realizing how this project um, could have could have gained like a big attraction if it was kind of just more fun or if I'd had more fun uh, designing it rather than kind of like forcing myself into a weird hold of sadness and frustration at the world. So it kind and of- when did you, And when did you work that out about it? So when did you work out, uh, how long after creating it did you think, actually, I wish I'd had a little bit more fun with it? Um, probably, I guess it was probably, probably towards, probably towards the end and when we just started, uh, talking a lot more about what we were doing with adapt, like also seeing Joe's work because Joe's work has always been fun, humor. And then right. I think it was kind of like, kind of really been inspired by, by the way she works and then applying that to the way I work and research. And I think that was kind of, uh, I was like, ah, I still, I still love the project. I still really like dark work, but at the same time, it's, uh, so when you're talking to trying to get a lot of people to understand what you're talking about sometimes humor and accessibility and having fun with it is a great way to do that yeah um and should we have a look at um your project as well Josie yeah so this wheel I don't know if you'll be able to see it in um a huge amount of detail but it was uh from my final project that was called get wheel and it was um started with this piece I was looking at subcultures and the way that we align with cultures through the internet and how um, even just in the last 25 years our whole attitude towards subcultures has, has completely changed so this is like a wheel of fortune style game wheel and every layer has a different sort of um, subcultural term so yeah. you spin all the different layers um, and make new subcultures like arbitrarily um, and so some of them were like post farmer punk or like um, anti-conservative boys or whatever, but it just completely mixes all the words up and makes these random subcultures. And the premise of the um, the wheel, the context of the wheel um, was that it was found as a relic 300 years in the future <laughs> of um, <laughs> a game show <laughs> where people were so lost um, because they didn't know what subculture to align themselves to, that they went on this game show hoping to be made over. Um, and they inevitably ended up with something that they really, really hated and didn't understand at all, um, which is actually on the next picture. Yeah, so this was the <laughs> the host, Kathy Whelan. Um, <laughs> and it was just a really stupid, silly video and piece that, I just, yeah, I just wanted to sort of poke fun at this idea that, especially for our generation that have grown up with the internet for essentially our whole like autonomous lives, how we don't have the same sort of political, subcultural um, bases as like our parents' generation or even more recent generations um, and how a lot of subcultures really embodied some sort of political spirit or meaning and I think it was really inspired by um I think it was about five or six years ago there was a a subculture called health goth um which wasn't really a subculture it was just an internet trend but I just find that so funny that we'd gone from having like punks that had so much to say to people that wore black to the gym and called themselves health goths and like yeah, a lot of this, so using humour to sort of describe these difficult uh, situations that we find ourselves in and poke fun of ourselves as a way to communicate uh, something important is like something that 
we start well I started doing with this project and has become one of the main sort of ethos of ADAPT. Yeah um, I was going to pick up on humour in a second actually but I mean um, just before talking about that what's interesting about both those projects and they're both really interesting I have to say is um, they're both um, this might be a really obvious thing to say but both um, anthropological aren't they? They're, they're really looking at um, people and behaviour and um, uh, and I can sort of see, it might be an easy thing to say in retrospect, but you can see the path from those projects to something like climate action quite, uh, I mean, perhaps not, not, not easily, but you can see it's there. You can see why you're interested in um, climate action and behaviour change and, you know, averting a, a humanity-wide addressing a humanity-wide issue and averting a humanity-wide crisis, you know, there's, uh, um, there's, uh, there's that sort of scale uh, and interest in human behaviour in both those projects, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, and we, we, we both come out and kind of at it from kind of different angles, but I think it also, um, it takes up a lot of, uh, especially during our MAs, it, and it still does now, but very much focused on climate and ADAPTS work, but before it took up a lot of just what we talked about all the time. And I think it's like, it was quite like a, nat a natural interest for us. And it's not, it's sometimes frustration, but sometimes it's just, it's just interesting and it's fun. And I think, yeah, I think to be fair, no one's actually ever made that connection before. So actually when you say it, it's like, oh yeah, that, that does, uh, that is a pathway to <laughs> adapt and climate. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about humour. I think it's a, a, a good, a good subject. I mean, we've in uh, uh, Do the Green Thing, we've, had to account for or defend the use of humour, um, so, you know, on, on multiple occasions around the issue of the climate crisis, and and obviously there's not much that's funny about the climate crisis on one level. Um, and um, what what's your why 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 did you decide to bring humour to the, the table there? What what use? What's the what does it do that other tones can't? For example, in this particular addressing this particular problem. So I think it's a really multifaceted um, issue for us because I wrote my um, my dissertation for my masters on the use of humour within graphic design, like to communicate and to convey information. Um, the main the main draw for us was that at the time, especially when we started to adapt, it was the key information about climate change that wasn't being communicated. And when it was, and much like today, although there is a much broader um, reach of information now from a lot of different voices, but at the time it was just scaremongering and it was really, really frightening and hard hitting. Mm. And there was a study by Harvard, um, which was about the use of humor in teaching activity. And they had a control group that were taught um, in a very straightforward, normal way. And then they had a group that were taught by a teacher that used humor and their memory retention of this topic was up to 50% higher. Um, but also there's lots of different theories about why we find stuff funny and why we laugh at things. And one of the main um, theories, although no one knows for sure, which is a really odd thing, um, is that we laugh to dispel our own fear at things yeah. or to show that we aren't threatened by things. Um, and I think if you're at a point where you're only feeling fear and you're only feeling threatened by this thing that is so ginormous and unfathomable, then you're not going to be able to act or um, think clearly about it or make a difference in a meaningful way. So. Yeah. If we laugh and make this an issue that we can like tangibly imagine and not feel horrendously arrested by, then I think that's only good for action, really. Yeah, I think like the like the idea of like when if you if we're kind of always laughing at it and stuff, then we yeah like our audience generally feels like relaxed, and then it does allow us to be more. Um, we don't have to use humour all the time and when we want to be a bit more serious about a particular topic or a particular post or a particular project we can bring that in and then it's kind of not yeah it's like it's not scaring you all the time but it's in the right way where you can be serious but then also ensure people are relaxed and willing to listen and have fun at the same time yeah yeah 
I mean, I really agree with um, all, all, all the things you're saying there. I wonder, do you have people who don't agree? Do you have people who have questioned or criticised you for that approach? Um, yeah, definitely. I think we often discuss at great length whether something is appropriate or whether it might be pushing it too far for certain people. Um, and I think you can't possibly please everyone. We try and be as like um, respectful and kind and we tend not to use people as the subjects of humour unless it is a really high ranking politician that's done something really bad <laughs> um, because they should be held to, held to account. Um, but we don't, we don't pick on individuals and, and for that reason, like we don't believe that that is the best use of humour. We should use it to like unify us and not to like s separate people out. Um, yeah. But there are always things that people will pick out because it's the internet. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a struggle yeah. sometimes. Also, also, like every, you know, not it's like Adapt isn't the only organization. You know, there's like people come to us when they want humor, but then there's also amazing other climate organizations who people can go and find their a communi a form of communication that speaks to them. So I think everyone can exist together. It's just yeah, but there is always criticism. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that's right. I, I think it, it's um, you know, it's going to take um a sort of a human wide effort to actually. Um, slow and avert what's coming and uh, I think personally I think it's going to take all voices and different voices will appeal to different people and we should we should allow room for that I believe I mean is there um uh is there so humor obviously is one observation about what you do or one of the tools you use and humor um maybe you could say is part of um something that's a bit broader about what you do which is about creativity I mean you're very you, you go at the climate crisis or you go at inspiring climate action with creativity, don't you? And um, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because they're not, they're not quite the same thing. I mean, humor is one flavor of it. Obviously you've got design, style, wit, um, imagination, et cetera, a bunch of stuff that goes into your outputs. Yeah, yeah okay. So, um... I think like yeah so sometimes in so when we're writing obviously it can be funny and I think um that kind of ha that kind of happens and then sometimes when the writing isn't so funny the design can be really fun and um can be a bit experimental and then sometimes we feel like that conveys conveys fun and humor in a way in the way in the way that it's styled so sometimes that kind of like humor slides into the design in that way and then I think like the one thing we always try and do is the one thing what we're allowed to do with adapt because it's like what it's our own it's our own thing is we can almost try anything we want so all the projects we do tend to be very different if it's the sort of self-initiated adapt work obviously with clients it's different and then we try and bring our own way of communicating and style into that work because sort of we really believe in it but if it's our own project we always try and do something that's different if we see oh we would love to you know design we would love to put on an exhibition and work with all these amazing artists um mainly because we really want to work with them but then we'll kind of be like do that and then bring them into the conversation on climate change uh, which i guess like collaboration is a big part of adapt or um yeah for example like when we did the scarf project we were like uh it'd be really great to start working around scarves and clothing but in, uh, in adapt ways so we're like let's just try that and have fun we've also done like a planet party we just wanted to throw a party and bring yeah. clients into that so I think it's always it's just constantly having fun, which makes us feel like we're being current and constantly pushing ourselves. And then hopefully I think that just naturally comes across. Yeah, definitely. And I, I also think that um, we, when we first started Adapt, we were thinking there's not a huge amount of creative response to the climate crisis mm. at that time. And it's amazing now because there was a lot. Um, but especially people that have come from a visual communication background, like we have exactly the tools to talk about climate change. Um, and what we wanted to do was just bring other people who wouldn't necessarily have the time or like a direct opportunity to do that alongside their own practices or their working lives 
um, and like make it really easy for them to get involved and like hopefully affect the creative industries a bit in that way as well, just yeah. through osmosis. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, I was about to say that really relates to accessibility and then kind of like, I know just another part of us where we're trying to make our language really easy to read. And I think bringing people in is kind of what brings different lang languages and ways of speaking into that, I think. Yeah. Um, just something you said just now, uh, Josie, about coming from a visual communications or visual design background. Did you th Do you think specifically when you were looking at the world of um, uh, climate action, creative climate action, let's say, did you think specifically that that was something that was missing or something that was needed more? The visual yeah. side? Yeah, definitely. I feel, and I still think that there is a huge, um, like we're really missing a trick um, in a lot of climate communications, just because there is like a decades old sort of rule book about how to talk about and how to like visualize anything to do with the environment. That's yeah. Just, um, what are some of those rules? Tell me. Uh, green, everything. Yeah, like, trees, leaves, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so we haven't got this rule anymore, but one of our rules when we first started was absolutely no green and no pictures of leaves. Um, and now, we're not that strict with ourselves but we i i do think that there's there's been a massive uptake in people making really exciting great work around the climate crisis so i don't think it's that much to worry about anymore but there is still such a huge um fascination with making everything like beige and neutral tones and like making it look very muted when really the issue at hand is attracting people and and getting people together and people like eye-catching things <laughs> yeah know. definitely definitely <laughs> but that's the like that's the way to get people's attention um and yeah. I feel also there's a lot of especially in um bigger so the more established uh NGOs have an established um base of supporters and, and I feel like there needs to be more new organizations that really speak for people that aren't yeah people that aren't the old established like supporters of Greenpeace that have been there for years um but people that are just sort of getting involved and, and finding out and still need a bit of a we need more information and need a bit of a push absolutely absolutely I think your work does um does that so well um I think it might be a good moment to perhaps go to our main course and look at um and uh, the idea of a main course is to show or share a project or two that's very much about sort of defining your that's, that's career defining for you or sort of reputation defining. So what have you got? Um, yes, I think so. This one, which uh, was actually quite a while ago now, but I think it was the project that really, in a way, like not the term put adapt on the map, but it definitely got us a lot more traction, I think, and show people what we could do. Partly because I think we wanted to show people what we could do and how we could communicate on a large scale rather than just sort of uh, a lot of people were sort of thinking of us as an Instagram at the time. Um, so the project was called Sadness is a No-Go Zone and it was just a big climate exhibition. And, and basically how it started is we just um, we didn't, knew there were so many creatives, like we said, that wanted to talk about climate change and weren't really doing it but had amazing work and just needed an avenue so we just kind of set we just set a brief of phrases uh using those sort of humorous phrases um and asked them to respond to them uh with a piece of work and then it just this all just kept rolling and it escalated and then i think we had 50 artists some of them uh, wow. we just who are like now really good friends but also at the time really admired their work and just wanted to connect with them and then kind of ended up bringing them all into this space and um the space was divided into um different topics so there was the wilding room which is here and then i think we had a, we had a travel room and an energy room and the work was kind of situated around that and then we had some uh partners i think ecosia was the partner there which we were kind of working with their search engine to plot, get people to plant trees in the space and i mean it was just really it was just really good good fun i think and it was only for a weekend but it was kind of good turnout and we had we had music at the end and all this stuff. So, uh, yeah, is there anything? 
No, I don't think yeah. so. <laughs> That's terrific. Um, and who were the, what, what sort of contributors did you have? Um, t- tell us a couple of the, the people maybe. So we had um, a huge range of designers um, and illustrators. So we had Patrick Savile um, and Tom Noon. Um, Sarah Boris. Sarah Boris. Oh, Sarah, she's so great. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Harry Butt was there. Harry Butt. Um, Brilliant. Brilliant. And one of our favourite pieces actually was by um, Will. Oh, Brin- Brinley. Brinley, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and he made this massive um, banner, which was for the protests that were happening at the fracking plant at Frack Free Lancashire. Um, and it said, you can frack right off. And they were blocking the road to stop vehicles going in so they could uh, shut down the plant basically. And he found out the exact width of the road and made a banner to fit. Um, And the idea was that we'd display it for three days and then send it straight up to Lancashire to be used in situ. Um, And it was just as we were setting up the exhibition, we found out that the plant had been closed down. So, a win um, and it was one of the best pieces but it's just like now we get to exhibit it again so that's it's pretty good for us. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, you, you know, sort of slightly signaled by the fact that you had different spaces in the exhibition um, and you said it you both said it a little bit earlier I mean climate, climate change or the climate crisis or the environment or whichever way in you want to go it's it's a complicated it's a very complicated area and obviously it's um you know it's social it's economic it's to do with um the patriarchy it's to do with racial justice um i i wonder whether um and maybe some of the people watching um might be tuning in just wondering how you start how you start to even get hold of that subject do you need to be do you need to just dive in do you need to be incredibly well researched do you need to know the different parts you need the theory of change around how the world can get around this and the and the various things that need to happen do you need a sort of a map of that how do you how do you deal with the climate crisis how did you do it when you started out um i think at, at the time because it was the sadness was almost a year and a half two years ago now i think i think now we definitely do it differently um just because we've just learned a lot more as time has gone on um but i think we've always kind of felt like the best way is like you can't so we can talk about everything in relation to the climate crisis so we kind of set allowed kind of set these sort of benchmarks of topics but then everyone could talk about what they wanted within them because we thought a really good way for people to learn is through other people um through other people's voices and um i think that that kind of lent itself well but at the same time mm. we had, uh, these information boxes um in the space which kind of we put a lot of sort of factual stuff that was going on at the time and i think that's why it was because an exhibition was a fixed moment in time if it kind of existed online now some of that information would be changing and kind of we would know more so it would, like, it would change but i think at that moment in time it's what it's what we knew it's what we had researched and it kind of yeah it, it kind of it kind of worked a bit of information for people to learn from and then go and just have conversations in the space based on other people's work and just giving that people that intro into climate rather than trying to like feed them all the information they need that's going to put them into a bit of a hole yeah on their own voice and way of talking about it yeah yeah i I agree um a a question from uh jordan um who's asking how does your how does your creative work help to stop the climate crisis so uh, other than raising awareness, how do you help to stop the climate crisis and what can other creatives do to help? So, chances. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So we, I mean, we've been talking about this, we've been talking about this quite a lot. Um, so when it's, when it's someone's a client work, we always try and help if people have a sustainable project or a project centered around climate change or community, we will then try and help them communicate in the best way. Cause obviously that project tends to be, linked to a solution or something that can I mean help us on that path of climate where whether it's working with even just helping communicate um sort of uh the city of London's um 
projects where they're talking to um trying to get a lot of people's input from the from different communities we'll just try and help push that or um making sure people are aware of the most impactful ways that they can use their voice um and helping like rally voices in that way is like one of the biggest things that we do um mm. and alongside educating people also helping people go and have conversations with their loved ones and people in their immediate circles because in order to make change you need a lot of people on side and there are still lots of opinions that sort of need a bit of um God, that's the wrong way to say it but could do with shaping a little bit um yeah. or people that aren't quite like aren't quite behind um climate action and don't really see a need for it and then the, they have might have a family member that will be able to go home and completely convince them otherwise and get them on side um one of my favorite things you've done is one of those guides to um awkward slightly recalcitrant resistant family members um which i think are so they're so good because they're they're very it's very funny it's also just very sharp it's a very good sharp observation um and it's such an easy action isn't, isn't it? it it makes you think about tackling climate the climate crisis with people maybe who it's not so easy to have the conversation with and that is a form of effect i think that's a form of um yeah that's a form of working i would say also um holding people to account is something that we do a lot so one of the most recent things that we did um was last year um the arctic had been burning for an extraordinarily long time and it wasn't being covered um, in any of the major newspapers apart from the guardian um, and we were just sort of outraged that every single day we'd see the newspaper covers and it would be something completely irrelevant and unimportant when this huge event was happening and there were heat waves of 39 degrees um, in siberia so we made these stickers um, and distributed them out uh, around the UK for people that wanted to use them themselves. And it said, more important, the Arctic's on fire. Yeah. Just to stick on top of newspaper front covers of any story that we didn't think was as important as the Arctic being on fire. Um, and got people to post it on social media um, and challenge those newspapers and hold them to account and then um, leave the newspapers in the supermarkets so that shoppers would also see it. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's one of the, like, basically directing energy where it's most needed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you, uh, it's a good question from Kieran, actually, which sort of relates to what you were just saying is, what's your advice for getting to know the right people to make these projects happen? And the reason I think it might relate is actually sometimes people come on board, partly because they think something's good or in a, a, a space for create is a good creative space or creative opportunity, but partly that sometimes they come on board because they know something's going to have impact. Um, and in terms of, uh, and, and Kieran, if you're able to um, reply in the chat, maybe it sounds like you've got a project in mind and it'd be really interesting to know what it was in terms of how you're looking to, um, you know, make it happen. But um, yeah, so getting to know the right people to make these projects happen, how do you do that? Um, I'm trying to kind of just, I think we've, we've always been really good at, asking people i think it's like it's just just not caring too much like if people say if people say no that's fine but then when we have always if we whether we've asked for a collaborator or money or stuff it's like really putting the effort into asking so whether it's um you know it's making that whether it's like making that deck making sure everything's communicated really well but also make sure they kind of really see what we're what we've always done it is make sure they see what we're trying to do with adapts like putting adapts into that presentation and trying to make it really fun and then sometimes people just buy into it um and it kind of it kind of works and then i think just connect our main thing is like connecting with people online and um i guess social media has been really good for that for us um we kind of network sometimes in person but i think a lot of it's just happened online really yeah and, and just kind of keep those relationships going and then Sometimes we talk to someone almost a year ago and then something they, it comes back around. I think it's important just to kind of just keep just keep that going, I think. 
Yeah, I think we were really, really surprised at the beginning um, with how many people wanted to say yes to collaborating. We thought it was going to be really, really difficult to get people to agree to work with us. And people were really excited about doing something about um, the environment and also just really keen to get involved with new projects. So now we're very confident at asking people. Um, and, and yeah, like Rich said, if some people say no, they say no, but yeah. be surprised, <laughs> yeah. Well, that might be another that might be a nice um bridge over to your other main course which is the scarves project isn't it is that right yeah you want yeah. to talk about that because that involves some collaborators doesn't it yeah i wonder is it possible to play the video first it might just do a bit of explaining better than we can do yeah. <laughs> We're launching these protest scarves because we saw a similarity between football fans and protest crowds in the fact that there's so much energy and it's all people gathered together for one cause. So we worked with six artists to produce their own scarf with their own message, supporting a cause of their choice. I think the clearer the message, the better. Behave! <laughs> I decided to fight for the bees. I think a lot of people don't realise how important pollinators are for our planet and for our own survival. The UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. We need trees to survive and get us out of the climate crisis. And yeah, just keeping it simple, plant or die. Having a piece of clothing with a message on kind of gives a back signal to other people who are about the same cause. The scarf is not only a sign of solidarity for the movement, but also a sign of solidarity within the movement itself. My scarf says clean up your act sort of what teachers say to school children um, and because of the school kids being the primary voice of climate activism I thought it was a funny thing to say to the government and damaging corporations. I chose the slogan wake up world it seems like we are all sleepwalking through what is kind of the biggest human existential crisis. We produced two scarves which will be selling with a percentage of the profits going to client earth. The scarves are made with uh, natural and traceable yarn and produced in the UK by EcoKnitwear. EcoKnitwear has been founded as looking at eco and sustainability as one of the key factors. These are Italian yarns. Um, this was one of the um, only really family run factors we found um, that can provide full traceability of where all of the yarns are coming from. We've taken those images that um, Adapt have given us and that's turned us into a design for the back and a design for the front. And what happens is there's two beds on the knitting machine, one which is doing the front and one that's doing back. And it turns the relevant stitches and makes sure that each of those stitch together perfectly. There's a bit of waste yarn. Our vision is we want to be able to reuse this as well. There's just so much waste, and especially in fabric, so many offcuts, and they usually just get put in the bin. I do a lot of upcycling. I always unknit things, unravel yarn, and reuse it in my projects, which is why I keep every scrap. Por eso he decidido utilizar materiales reciclados para crear esta bufanda y esta bandera. My scarf says, "Not cool, not cool in terms of global warming and the climate crisis, and then not cool in terms of." The inaction and lack of caring from governments and policymakers, uh, and there's with power to make a difference. A systemic change is needed. By protesting, by showing what we feel, is just calling out and saying, which is a bunch of individuals that we really care for the planet, but you have the power. Previously, with so many other activist groups or subcultures, um, fashion and clothing has been such a huge part of communicating an idea. But as we've seen the internet come through and for everybody to be able to micro-collage their own identities, we lose a lot of our statements in our clothing. And I think we really want to bring that back because we want people to be able to wear their feelings on their sleeve and for everyone that they encounter on a daily basis to understand what they stand for instead of it just existing online. Anything else you want to say? I think that's pretty much it. Great project. It's a brilliant project. What? Why? Um, just explain, uh, or perhaps not explain. Perhaps account. Um, why would you not, for example, because you do lots of different things? Um, are you ever tempted to say, okay, we're going to be scarves. We're just going to be the climate scarves people. 
Um, Why is that a bad idea? Um, for our own sanity. <laughs> we, we need to keep sort of uh, like testing ourselves and our ideas in different ways. Otherwise, I think we, we get quite stagnant. And yeah. When we do work that we're excited by, hopefully other people will get excited about it and not have the impact that we want. And I, I feel like we sort of trundle along to a stop if we just decided to do one thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, but except it's funny, isn't it? Because people, because um, there are sort of entrepreneurs um, um, either in the kind of inclusive economy or the extractive economy who go, we found our thing. It's going to work. We're going to specialize. We're going to maximize. We're going to make it as profitable as possible or as impactful as possible. There are people who do that. Definitely. I think like we've definitely had like ideas for like long term plans, which I think are kind of around that. But that doesn't mean we're still going to carry on doing the things we love doing, because even if someone I know, I guess part of what we do as well, when we kind of like when we're doing workshops and different things is working with like young people and if we can inspire them to kind of go on and maybe they go realize a project, which is just specifically one thing from something we've done, then, you know, we'd be kind of happy with that. Or even there's been times as well, we're like, okay, well, we'll do this and then maybe we'll stop climb work. And then actually we kind of, when we're doing that, we actually sometimes really enjoy it. So it's, yeah. it's I think we just, yeah, we just really like doing, doing a lot of different things to be honest. And learning and learning, I would say. Learning and being responsive because you never know the next thing that's going to, like really like enrage you to the point of like wanting to do something about it yeah. and it, don't have the opportunity to just be able to like drop what you're doing and create something new then it can get really frustrating um yeah. so yeah we just want to be able to react and respond to things as and when they happen um a question from elena and it's i'll throw in a question of my own after it as well which is um She's asking, um, how do you two work together? Who does what? And the question I was going to throw in as well is what do you call yourselves? Because you're, um, you know, you've been adaptive capacity, you've been a climate club, you've been a studio. I see the word studio. Are you communication? Are you design? So Elena's question first and then throw my question in and I'll throw a third one in as well. <laughs> um, so I'd say... On most of our projects, we work really collaboratively. Like we go back and forth with different things um, and we'll add bits because we've both got, both from a creative background, both got visual communication experience, but I come from a more illustrative and like image making um, and like uh, creative concepts, although you do that as well, which is very technical. Um, I think we come from concepts at completely different in completely different ways so we'll, we'll do the idea process together um and when we figured out exactly what the best way, way is to approach um the work that we're doing we sort of divide and conquer but then always come back to each other and collaborate so i don't particularly think we've got like roles that are that different no not particularly like so yeah like I'm minding more yeah technical stuff but then I think it just depends what the project is and sometimes sometimes even on projects we're like oh we haven't done that before uh, that might cause a bit of stress but let's do it and let's learn how to do it and um, that could be fun uh, and or we'll get someone in to help I think yeah I think it's, it's it, it works like it just works it works well and we kind of just <laughs> we don't question it <laughs> it runs smoothly yeah <laughs> Um, are, you, are you communicators or are you designers or is it am I asking the wrong question um I think we're both because I have yeah I'd say I'm not as good at being concise within design as Rich Rich is very good at communicating via design very concisely but then I do like, all the copywriting and her way of saying she's a lot more concise with words, with and words. she's very good with words and but then when I have creative like visual ideas it tends to get quite messy <laughs> so I feel like we're both designers and we're both communicators in completely different ways yeah and I think we are both yeah and we finish each other's work all the time like you know you'll be doing Joe's will be doing something then I'll take in and do a bit or I'll be like doing something Joe's will take in do a bit it's kind of just nice yeah. nice 
That sounds like a good working arrangement. Um, what's your relationship to the word activism? Ooh. I think I think everyone should be an activist. I think that's that's like kind of like I think it's just it should be inherent in who you in who you are. If you're kind of, I think everyone should. You know, that's just I, a term. So people have different associations with it, but it's like you know, be an activist and find your own way of being an activist and taking part in activism. Yeah, yeah. Um, here, here to a big scale however yeah um is it we're sort of coming to the end of our hour i wonder if we could just have a a, a little peek at your next meal which is the idea of a project that someone else has done that you're inspired by and gives you um you know is it, it gives you a sense of where or it gets you excited about where creativity could be or where in what direction it could go so what did you what did you pick out well it wasn't um one particular um project but just michael clark's entire career and his entire ethos and approach because he took something that was previously really inaccessible um ballet and made it very accessible completely turned the industry on its head um whilst also improving and working within the industry he uh made what was considered highbrow um very fun um interesting creative uh and popular and he didn't see any um like limitations to people's interests or understanding in uh the art form so he didn't dull anything down or um try and fit into anything that he didn't think was uh, that he thought he thought people would be able to like understand and access everything really well, um, and then he also yeah so we could, oh, you could feel we could yeah <laughs> just the way that he communicated he communicated so much not through his own practice and his work but also through the graphics and the design and the whole encompassing of everything that he did. Um, he really had a point to make, but he did it in such a cheeky and fun and like lovable way. Yeah. Uh, and continually innov innovated. Even now, he's still keeping on top of everything um, in terms of like developments. He he never like, gets left behind, and he adapts and changes to the world. So his like process of working was like um, he kind of in the same way that I think we try and do is like bringing people in who are not just there to be directed or told what to do but are very much like part of forming that creative vision so there you know he, he would bring people in to his work who would then kind of have input and then form the identity form the dance form all of it so it wasn't just you know him it's everyone he's surrounded himself with and I think I guess that we try and bring that into what we do as well it's like yeah we don't limit ourselves by what who we are what we know is by forming our projects through the people we work with. Yeah, I think the parallels are really good. Those are, first of all, it's a brilliant example. I think uh, the parallels are really good to the way you approach the climate, climate crisis. And, um, you know, for, for, for him, ballet, for you, science, you know, climate science and how that can be translated and not be sort of and not be daunted by by the spirit of your creativity. I really agree. I, we are close to wrapping it up. I'd just like to ask one question. It's a, a, a bit of a naughty question, actually, which is about um, what do you say to people? Um, what do you say to young creatives or next gen creatives who don't want to engage with the climate crisis? Or I suppose another way of asking the, the question is, should every creative now, creative person be engaging with this subject? Or why, should, or why aren't they? Or, what, or should they be? I'm asking the same question very badly two ways um it's really tricky because i feel like if anyone's not engaged they're gonna have to be very soon anyway um i feel like most people now have a level of understanding that we didn't even have two years ago um and 
part of the reason for that is because it's been creatively communicated or put forward to us um, by creative people in a way that we can understand in lots of various different forms. Um, and that's reason enough to want to do it. Um, also because I think the industry is just going that way. Um, the world is going that way. We're becoming more aware, we're becoming more in tune. Um, and I think it's a case of engage or get left behind in a way. Also, like, I don't think your your work is your work doesn't necessarily have to really involve it be directly involved with climate, like you know, everything's connected. And I think if your desire it's more about like whether your design is solving is tackling an issue that is affecting society in whether it's like your community bigger or whatever and I think if you do that in a positive way or where you feel is positive trying to make a difference it will eventually it can have a knock-on effect to the climate or affect other different issues and I think I think as a role designer I think it's just been you know trying to trying to do good with your design when you can and try and tackle social issues and hopefully it connects to climate hopefully it connects to something else but and we know that that is a, it's easy enough for us to say that and it's like there aren't the opportunities or the time for a lot of people to make specific work um, about the climate crisis. But I think, um, like you said, engagement is really important. Just being aware because mm -hmm. it's already gathering so much pace, especially within the um, creative industries that I really see a lot of work being shaped, shaped with an environmental, um, yeah, awareness. So, yeah, we're staying on top of it. Yeah, well said. I, I really, uh, I really agree. I think it's so um, important to engage because otherwise, because you're going to have to engage very, very quickly. Um, and uh, uh, and it's um, you know it's great to work. At, you know your your work is. Your work shows that um, work created from that space or with that with that concern or cause can be just very creative, very inspiring. You know, wonderful work on anyone's on anyone's terms. So, um, thank you so much. I'd just like to um, wrap up now um, and just give a few thanks out to um, Felix Townsend, who's one of the new blood uh, winners from year before last, who's uh, did our wonderful foodie identity, and then to Yuri Suzuki, a, a partner of mine at Pentagram and his team for creating our wonderful bits, bit of intro music with knives and forks and pots and pans. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming uh, and um, tuning in to Josie and Rich and for your questions. And of course, most of all, thanks to uh, brilliant Josie and Rich at that Climate Club. Um, this dinner will be up on DNAD site in a matter of days. And then um, at the end of June, uh, if you fancy another dinner with, we've got the, um, Wonderful, wonderful Mona Chalabi, who's that brilliant uh, illustrator, journo, um, you know, data journalist who uh, is just absolutely fantastic. And that would be another great dinner. Um, but meanwhile, thank you so much to Rich and Josie, the wonderful creative duo behind Adapt, and see you all very soon. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us.